So between the Steelers' new coaches, who's going to make the biggest impact? It's easy to say Brian Flores, but I do want to look closer at Pat Meyer on the offensive line and Frisman Jackson for the wide receivers. We'll also talk about a question on Najee Harris. Joining me today is Jenna Horner of WPXI. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things on the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button if you enjoy this video. Hit the subscribe button to our YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our breaking news updates when we have bonus episodes. We thank you for making the Lockdown Steelers podcast your first listen every every day. Joining me as always, we love to have her on Fridays. It's Jenna Harner of Channel 11 WPXI. Jenna, what's up? Chris, glad to be here. As always, happy Friday. We made it to the end of the week, and it's a holiday weekend, so what's not to love? It is a holiday weekend. It's about to be, it's actually July. This episode is our first episode of July. Um, the, the fourth is around the corner. It's going to be a lot. I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm happy. It also means this is Steelers training camp month at the end of the month. We're back and we're going to the trove. It's going to be exciting. We are just through the roof about this right now. But yeah. Jenna, one of the biggest things we're going to see at the trove is how this coaching staff is going to handle these players. You know, Mike Tomlin is 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 indifferent. He's always the same. He's consistent. He knows what he wants. He, he and, and the players know what to expect from him. But there's three new assistants that I think are going to be very vital to what the Steelers do that year. And of course, that's Brian Flores, a defensive def- assistant who's supposed to be working primary with the linebackers. But we've seen work with every defensive positional group. Yep. There's Frisman Jackson, the new wide receivers coach, and Pat Meyer, the new offensive line coach. And I guess the question is. Who do we think is going to make the biggest impact on what the Steelers become in 2022? Again, as I said in the intro, Brian Flores, easy answer. But this offensive line is going to be so key to what this this team needs to be able to do to run the ball and to protect their newer, younger quarterbacks as they get used to being on the team and learning the playbook and, 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 and whatnot. I just look at this as an opportunity for the Steelers to get some some fresh new approaches on how they coach them up. And I guess I wanted to uh, let's start with with Pat Meyer, because the uh, as an offensive line coach, you know, they had they've, they've ran through offensive line coaches since Mike Malarkey. You had uh, Sean Serrett, his his assistant stepped up for two years. That didn't work out. His assistant, Adrian Clem, stepped up for one year, then left before the season was over. Now they went and got a whole new approach, a veteran from the Panthers in Pat Meyer. And we've heard interesting things that the, the line seems to like him. But what's your your feel from when you talk to players and what you what you were able to see at OTAs and minicamp? Well, it's interesting, too, because when you look outside the organization, sometimes it is always good to kind of get that fresh perspective. So with Meyer coming in from Carolina, I think that can benefit this team a whole lot just because of, you know, looking at his bio and stuff and looking at what he dealt with with Carolina and that offensive line and the injuries and not having Christian McCaffrey and what they were still able to do and what they were able to accomplish. You look at a guy like Pat Meyer and you're like, all right, this could be that answer for the Steelers where he's not, you know, this giant flashy name. Oh, you know, he was the, you know, offensive line coach for the best OL last season, but what he was able to do, I think that can kind of reflect on a lot of what the Steelers have right now, where it's, they have young guys, they brought in some new faces and it's, Hey, this, you know, how, how can this unit kind of be cohesive? How can they come together? How can they solve the problems that I feel like for the last, you know, however many seasons, it feels like we've been talking about some of the struggles with this offensive line. And I think the approach that he's going to be, that he's going to bring is going to be great because I think just the way that we've seen these guys. And again, I feel like we always have to say it was OTAs and it was mini camps. So it was football Mm -hmm. in shorts. It wasn't anything crazy and you couldn't deduce a whole lot. Um, But I, I think that, some of the things that we saw here, you know, it gives you a little bit of, okay, like, you know, you're not seeing drastic changes by any means, but it's like, you feel like this team, this offensive line can be trending in the right direction, just based on having this new voice here too. 
I agree. And I think that's the thing here is the new voice is also a veteran voice. You know, yeah. one thing that and Kevin Dotson told me this straight up in the locker room. He talked about how, you know, I asked him because last year, Adrian Clem was all about getting more physical, being mean, being nasty on the offensive line. They wanted to establish that power. And like you saw there were sometimes they were nasty, just nasty and ineffective. Like, you know, like just, you know, like Ken Kendrick Green may be bullying this man over here, but it's not in the play. And right. he gave up his gap and, and Najee Harris is getting hit in the back field but um kevin dodson said the difference is is that pat meyer still wants that kind of tenacity but he's also very pointed in how he wants it when he wants it the tactics to get there and james daniels also brought up how important it has been to see pat meyer address each of the offensive linemen individually and say these are the things i saw uh, that, that that you're weak on you have to improve this if you are, if you're going to be who we need you to be on the steelers that kind of approach, I do think it's important. And it's a similar thing with Frisman Jackson. These are two veterans that that, that that are coming in here. And not that Ike Hillian wasn't a veteran before, but these are two guys who have, you know, I, I think a, a better experience or a, a wider experience of being a, a positional coach in the NFL than their predecessors. And uh, you, you see them in how they approach the game. It's just different. Pat Meyer, very hands-on. A lot of the receivers say the same thing for Frisman Jackson, and it confirms things we see and it can't officially report, but can confirm that you know he gets up in receivers' faces. You didn't see that much from, from Ike Hillard. He was more like backed off. He coached you up in the room, and when you were out there, you were out there and doing what you were supposed to do. But you know, but we see Frisman Jackson when he when you make a mistake, he's you know, he's on, in your face and on your case. And that approach, too, I feel like really can help a lot of young guys. And, you know, everybody learns differently. All the players kind of react to criticism and, hey, how do I fix this? How do I do that? Like, differently. But I really think, you know, for this offensive line and for the wide receivers in particular, I think that is just going to be such a good approach because, again, we know some of the struggles that – they've had with dropped passes and with the small mistakes and running the wrong routes and doing some of the wrong things at certain times throughout last season that, Hey, maybe having this approach where it's like, okay, I can tangibly know what I did wrong, how I did it wrong. How do I fix it? I'm not going to, you know, you almost kind of do want to be afraid to not make the same mistake again. I feel like that coaching approach too was always a good one. At least that worked for me, not saying, you know, it is or isn't going to work in the NFL. But, and I think it absolutely does, but you know, you have to be able to kind of comprehend and understand, Hey, this is what went wrong here. This is why it went wrong. And I'm going to make, make, you know, damn sure it's not going to happen again. Right, exactly. And, and and the Steelers want to make sure like, hey, we're we're taking a step forward from last year, not a step back. So I, I'm on the same page with you there. Um, and, and again, it's also, I think, important because these are two groups that are very much they're not none of the people in these groups are like in their in their late 20s to mid 30s, you know, like you know, or to early 30s. These are all groups that are basically in the middle of a reset. Uh, you know, from from when these groups were at their highest, you know, Antonio Brown, Mark Davis Bryant, Judas Smith Schuster, all those guys of the uh, you know that were there, you know, for for a few, for years you know, in the past years when the offense was ranking high in the NFL, all of that is you know you know was 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 fun, but they have to set a new tone, and you know they've tried to set that with Chase Claypool, with Deontay Johnson, and now you have George Pickens and Calvin Austin there. But a new tone needs to be set for how this group needs to think and approach every single week. The same thing goes for the offensive line. I think that, and the reason I asked this question, I know a lot of people are still probably saying, but what about Brian Flores? We'll get to him in the second segment. But Pat, if Pat Meyer and if and it, um, if uh, Frisman Jackson establish a good tone with this group and the Steelers get a core of guys that can take them over the next five to eight years and run those positions and make them so, you know, bring them back to being on the better half of the NFL, uh, you know, for their position groups. I think it does a lot for what the Steelers are trying to do with Kenny Pickett for the future, with the defense for the future, with this whole group that Mike Thomas trying to reassemble and say, Hey, we're not falling off. We're not fully rebuilding. We're just reloading and we're going to be coming back sooner than you think. No, absolutely. And I think, too, we talk about, you know, the, I guess, veteran, quote unquote, stature of Pat Meyer and Frisman Jackson. But then also there's additions 
in these groups that are quote unquote veterans. I mean, I think the addition of Miles Boykin for the receivers room is going to go a whole lot with Jackson getting his message along because you kind of sometimes always need that, I guess, quote unquote liaison where, you know, you have a guy who's been there, done that, where it's like, Hey, I'm trusting you to kind of get the message across to some of these guys that it might not be getting across to. And I'm not saying that it's not, but you know, you, you have the guy like that. And then you have, you know, James Daniel and Mason Cole, who they brought in on the offensive line and having those, you know, Mm -hmm. veteran voices or just more experienced than where this line has been. That for Meyer is a great, you know, kind of vestibule where it's like, Hey, I'm going to pass this along, but I'm going to trust that you guys are going to be the ones making sure it gets spread across to all of these younger guys. And too, again, going back to Meyer's approach, I think something that's so intriguing is that We've seen the last couple years, some of the guys on the offensive line not playing positions that they're entirely accustomed to, like Kendrick right. Green in himself. I think that was a huge, you know, huge step for him to play center the way that he mm-hmm. did and all that he had to do for this team. And I think that having Meyer there to kind of help these guys, even if it's not their natural position on the line, say, hey, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to be. I think that level of teaching too adds such, you know, it increases the knowledge and it increases what these guys need to do to make that next step so much more. I agree. It's a big part of this, them taking their next step and we see where they go. But again, we we're about to address Brian Flores in just a minute here. But first, we got to talk to you guys about BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, news, including the Major League Baseball regular season which is now sadly jenna the only sport major sport going on there's there's college baseball wnba things like that but it's sad we get this part because i'm so used to when football's on the screen and then basketball's on the scene and then hockey's on the screen and then baseball and baseball's ending but it's like it's like still like you know there it's just like i i miss that part of the it's so fun when all the sports are on and now we're just we're sitting here in this desert of sports but if you want to still have fun with, with baseball, you go to betonline.net. It'll teach you the ways and the things that you need to know about all the odds, ends, and the, and the ways to make money off Major League Baseball so that you can get help get yourself a little bit faster to football season and make your money uh, while you do so. So, go to again, go to betonline.net, head to their website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action when you visit BetOnline, where the game starts. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, and Chris Carter, she's Jenna Harner. We're talking about the the new Steelers coaches and where they kind of fit in as far as who's going to make the biggest impact. And we talked about the two offensive coaches because the Steelers are very much rebuilding their offense. Uh, You know, new, you know, new quarterback, young wide receivers, you know, offensive line that still hasn't solidified who the core players are. All that's in play. But the defense is the part of the Steelers that is going to carry them and, and really has carried them for the past few years. Uh, and, you know, the, we know about TJ Watt, Cam Hayward, Minka Fitzpatrick, even Alex Highsmith. And there's excitement about what might happen at corner. But Brian Flores bringing to bring what he's bringing to the table. I wrote a piece on SteelersNow.com, by the way, go check out SteelersNow.com and all the people that write there right there. I wrote a piece there talking about, you know, with Brian Flores talking about the good rapport that he already has with Devin Bush. And for the Steelers defense to not just be good, but be great, they need their linebackers to be very solid this year. And not just not just like, you know, decent and occasionally making plays, but guys that with Miles Jack and Devin Bush are maybe not the most feared defenders in football or anything like that. But guys that when they when they're plugging holes, you see how effective they are. They're helping stop the run and they're not complete liabilities in coverage. If Brian Flores can pull that out, and I talked about, you know, Brian Flores' potential for reviving Devin Bush's career. If Brian Flores pulls that out, is that bigger than anything that Pat Meyer might do with the offensive line or Frisbee Jackson might do for the receiver group? 
I definitely think so. And I think that's what a lot of Steelers fans kind of have their eyes on this year is what is Devin Bush going to look like? And that's been such a focal point. We've talked about it so much. And I think so. there's so much conversation around it because there is that big question mark. And, you know, when we talked with Devin Bush, he was saying how excited he is just to be able to go back out there and play football again. And he said, and naturally everybody likes to take things out of context, but he said when we talked with him, he doesn't feel like he has to prove anything. And it was more of the fact that, he doesn't, I mean, you were, you were there for this conversation, Chris, mm -hmm. right? And it was yeah. I, the sense that I got from it was, he's just like, I'm going to go out there and play and get back to the level I know I can get to. He doesn't feel the need to have to, you know, oh, like I need to show that like he, it, it didn't seem like that. And I think that also is probably part of the mentality that Brian Flores is bringing to this defense. And I think it ties in with just the fact that, you know, every single guy that we've talked to on the defense has nothing but like glowing things to say about Brian Flores. And they love the way that he works with them. They, you know, Miles Jack told you that that was one of the big reasons he came here to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it, volumes. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, they, again, when I when I talk to when I talk to these guys, everybody and not just the linebackers, Terrell Edmonds talk talks about it. The cornerbacks talk about it, the defensive linemen talk about Brian Flores' impact. But Miles Jack was a guy who I said months before he even joined the Steelers. I'm like, and he was still on the Jaguars. I said that needs to be a guy that they go after because I don't think he's going to stick with the Jaguars too much longer. And he's a guy that would be a perfect fit next to Devin Bush. He's a veteran who has has been around the block a few times. He knows what it's like to work with different coaches and has a sense of that. But now Devin Bush is a younger guy looking to still establish himself. My, everyone knows who Miles Jack is. Everyone's, you know, they're, they're, he has a reputation. Heck, he was going to make $20 million last year from the Jaguars if they didn't let him go. But Devin Bush is looking to get to that level where everyone knows and respects what he brings to the table. And Brian Flores is a guy who sees their potential right now and, 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 and talks about, hey, like, this is what we have to do. I also think it's very important to note the way that Devin Bush talks about his health, he said this time last year, I wasn't sure if I could land on my feet and my knee would be okay. I was still figuring out how to, how to jump this way, cut that way and do those type of things. He's and you know, and, and I was getting limited reps in practice. I did cause they, they wanted to make sure that they were taking their time with me. Now I feel like I'm able to do everything again. And so Devin Bush, you know, if Brian Flores can, can get those two back to know, because here's here's the, the other part of this, Jenna, is that it's not just about the linebackers per se. It's about piecing the defense together. Yeah, we all we, we already know the safety group. Everyone's confident about uh, with Mika Fitzpatrick, Terrell Evans and the new addition of DeMonte Kizzee. Uh, You have the corners who are all veterans. Cameron Sutton, Levi, Levi Wallace, Akella Witherspoon. There's a lot, a lot of expectations there. And you even have some backups like Arthur Mollett and Trey Norwood, who people are like, OK, let's see what they bring to the table this year. Yeah. The defensive front. Everyone's excited about it. Larry Ogunjobi was just signed to play with Tyson Alualu, Cam Hayward. You got TJ Watt. You got Alex Highsmith, uh, 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 DeMarvin Leal's coming up. Chris Wormley still in the rotation. There's a lot of excitement for what that, that group can bring. If the linebackers can be the piece that glues it all together, yes. that could be the key to making this Steelers defense an elite defense again. Mm -hmm. And again, we've talked so much too about – the holes that were there last year and just a little bit of the uncertainty that it was. And, you know, by no means, I, I don't want to sit here and say it was, you know, completely off the rails type of thing, but they know that they weren't as good as what they were capable of. And mm -hmm. they will all say that when we talked with, you know, all of those guys, when we talked with Joe Schober, you know, they said like, there's a lot more that we need to do. And you saw a lot of it being exposed last year. And I think having, the voice of Brian Flores, who we kind of heard has a little bit of a, you know, quote unquote, like military um, style. Was that what the guys were saying? But hearing their perspectives in that way and just knowing what type of coach he is, how he works with all of these guys, what he brings to this defense that I think can really help them kind of see the players in themselves that they want to be and also say, hey, look, this is what the expectation is. I don't necessarily need my coach of my position group to tell me this because they know the impact that he has. They respect him as the head coach that he was in Miami. Like you hear, we heard Miles Jack. I'm trying to remember. We heard a couple more players talking. You know, they're like, we're basically getting a head coach at this position. Like this doesn't right. happen. Having that perspective too. I think they, you know, when Brian Flores talks, this defense listens. 
Absolutely. And I, I there it is important for Mike Tomlin to have assistants who can grab those players like that. And because Mike Tomlin, again, he is he sets the tone for the organization, but you, you still need your position coaches to be able to go into those rooms, say, hey, this is the expectations. This is what we need to do and have those players respond to those messages. And Brian Flores is a guy who, as soon as he walks in the room, he doesn't have to talk. He doesn't have to say anything. Everyone knows, okay, that's the guy. That's him. We, yep. there, there, there's that respect there. And, you know, just just seeing what he's working with to try to make Miles, Jack, and Devin Bush the the, the, the new Steelers linebackers. That they're great. He wants them to, to handle all these different roles at a high level. He doesn't just want them to be solid. And one thing Miles Jack said, he said, it's very different because he's like, before, when I was at Jacksonville, he's like, if I did something that was, like, decent, but not exactly what was expected. It was okay. As long as like I was in the vicinity of what I got done. He said with Brian Flores, it is either you did it right or you did it wrong. If you didn't do everything I told you, right. You're going, you're in the wrong and you messed up. I think that is, is very important to what the Steelers and they need that kind of direction, especially at the linebacker position. And and so again, we, we, we take it back to looking at all three of these assistants, the offensive line vital, the receivers, can explode games games open but i do think that if the linebackers are the biggest are the group to take the biggest step forward this year it puts the steelers defense on a completely different level and then we are talking about them being a top five defense in the league again we aren't talking about them having a bad run defense anymore and it's going to make it easy when you when that run defense is playing well and the pass rush is still coming it's going to make it easier for those defensive backs to make plays on the football which will get them the turnovers, give the offense more opportunities, and could be the tone that I think Mike Tomlin really wants this team to have as a as a, a complete roster. Yeah, absolutely. That is the tone that they want to set. And I think that if they can find ways to get to that point through Brian Flores and his message sinking in and through Devin Bush and Miles Jack being that tandem that I think a lot of people envision them to be, then all of a sudden we are talking about, oh, this Steelers defense is not only incredibly elite, but teams fear them. Teams don't want to you know, go in and be like, all right, we're going to run all over them because we know we can. It's going to be Oh yeah, we don't want to go against these guys at all because we know that like up front they're going to be menaces. TJ Watt's going to be coming in our face in th- you know 0.2 seconds, and oh, we're not going to throw deep because there's Mega Fitzpatrick back there. The corners back there are so tenacious and all that. I, I really think that if this, like you said, if they can kind of be that final piece, then this defense we're talking about a whole lot of different things than what we were talking about last year. I agree entirely. Um, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we want to answer a, a listener's question about the offense. We've talked a lot about, about the defense in this last segment. We want to flip it back to Najee Harris. It's an interesting question about him. We'll talk about that in just a minute right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Back here in the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Jenna Harner of Channel 11 WPXI. So, Jenna, we talked about the coaches, but let's get back to talking about the players specifically. And one player that everything focuses a lot on is Najee Harris. He's a big focal point for this offense. He's what a lot of this is going to be based off of. We had Parker from Indianapolis call in with a question about Najee Harris and what kind of a jump he could make in year two. Here's Parker. Hey, Chris, this is Parker from Indianapolis. Hey, I had a quick, quick question that was about Najee Harris making a year one to year two leap, kind of like Jonathan Taylor did, where he had a good first year, and then second year he just blew up the league. I know we have some offensive line concerns, uh, unlike the Colts did last year, but I just want to know what your thoughts on that is. Again, love the show. Thank you very much. And thank you, Parker, for your question. Um, always remember, if you ever want to want to call into the show and and get your question heard, you can call you you can call into our line. Remember, also, if you're international, you can definitely email us too. We, we we've gotten some calls from from some from England, some from Germany, um, but we've had people call, we've, we've had people email in. Remember, that's l o Steelers topic bag at gmail.com. and that's l o Steelers topic bag at gmail.com. Just be sure to include your name, where you're from, and attach that MP3. Um, and of course, if you want if you want to call in do the same thing please keep your messages under under a minute that really helps us out and if you want to call you call 412-223-6644 um thanks again to everyone who calls in especially parker with this last one now jenna when it comes to 
Uh, when it comes to Najee Harris, it's an interesting comparison for Jonathan Taylor because Jonathan Taylor was putting himself in MVP category discussions, you know, by mid to late season for the Colts. And, and to Parker's point, he had 1,169 rushing yards with 11 rushing touchdowns last year, or excuse me, two years ago in his rookie season. He had 1,468 total yards from scrimmage that year, but that jumped up to eight to over 1800 rushing yards and over 2100 yards from scrimmage with 20 touchdowns this, this past season again putting you putting himself in that conversation Najee Harris is of course a different type of back he had us uh, over 1600 yards in his first year so he already did you know more as far as volume for, for, for Jonathan Taylor. And I will say this, Jonathan Taylor is more of a break breakaway speed type of type of running back. He's more about, you know, making those big plays happen. Najee seems to be more of a guy like a lot like Le'Veon Bell and how he's quick. He takes the yards in front of you and he's very tough to put down in those shorter spaces and he'll be more efficient there. Um, but, you know, part of Parker's question, I think plays a huge part of this is what the offensive line does. Quentin Nelson and the Colts offensive line crushed people last year. And that was a big part of Jonathan Taylor's success. We've seen Najee Harris have good flashes for the Steelers, but what he could be with the Steelers offensive line, if they get their game together, could be truly dangerous. Oh, absolutely. And I'm going to be so intrigued to see how we see that line come together when they do start putting pads on at training camp and when they do get into the preseason games and week one against Cincinnati. How do they look and how does that help what Najee Harris is going to look to do? Because we've talked about it, you know, ad nauseum a little bit, how we know that a lot of this offense this year is going to be giving the ball to Najee Harris and letting him do his work. And I think that no matter who's at quarterback, that's going to be true this coming season. And so the Steelers kind of know, especially on the offensive line, hey, we have a bigger responsibility. And something that really intrigued me during minicamp was when you talked with Kevin Dotson and he gave you kind of a little bit of an interesting anecdote. And, you know, he kind of had some, you know, harsh criticism for himself, himself but also positive, you know, uh, you know, positivity for Najee Harris. Right. Because Kevin Dotson said, he said, if it wasn't for us, he felt, he felt that Najee Harris should have been a 2000 yard rushing running back last year. And he said that was on the offensive line and they don't want to be that the part that holds it up. And, you know, I asked Najee Harris what he thought about that. And he kind of brushed it off. And I was like, it shows Najee's maturity to not be like, yeah, of course I would have been. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want to put that on the Steelers offensive line. Um, but I'm sure he, I, I'm sure in, in his, in his own mind, he's thinking like, well, you know, there, there weren't that many holes last year to attack. And I was hit a lot in the backfield. Um, but I, I guess it's reasonable to say if Najee Harris is able to get these opportunities in in an offense that, you know, maybe people fear the down, downfield pass a little bit more, maybe people fear the play action a little bit more. Maybe there is a chance for Najee Harris to get those kind of yards. I, I think the, uh, the, I think the better question or way to phrase that question is how does he take that step forward to be to be have a Jonathan Taylor like year two is it more about Najee Harris or is it more about the rest of the Steelers offense I I honestly think it's more about the Steelers offense because just we know what he's capable of and we've talked with him I mean just I one of the most fascinating parts of talking with him during minicamp and OTAs or actually it was just minicamp but it was when he was asked about like the Vikings game. There was a particular play. Were you were you in this conversation? I feel like I remember this vaguely. Yes. Yeah. He was talking and he just like he knew the play immediately. Yep. He broke it down. He's like, oh, yeah, like I got hit by this guy and this, this. And like I knew I had to get these couple more yards. Like his his IQ of football is just mm -hmm. outrageous. But I, we know what he's capable of. We know the type like that. This is why the Steelers drafted him where they did in the first round because of what they knew he could not only bring to this team, but how he would fit in with this offense. And especially again, once their offensive line, because the offensive line doesn't need to be spectacular. It, mm -hmm. you know, obviously they want it to be, there's no question about that, but it doesn't have to go out and say, we're going to be the best offensive line in the entire league this whole season. They have to be better than they were last year. I say you have to be, slightly above average to see the Najee Harris that I think a lot of people know and can potentially expect where it's, you know, Hey, they're in the red zone, they're driving and we're going to find a hole for him and he's going to take it, you know, nine, 10 yards and, you know, get the touchdown. I think that's really what we're going to see from Najee. If the offensive line can raise their game 
decently more than it was last season because we know it wasn't spectacular last season. So if you get even just a little bit of a jump, that in turn, I think, gets Najee going more. That in turn allows you to open up the field a little bit more and get the downfield passing game. Like I think there's a lot of like it starts with the offensive line and where can it branch out from there? No, I, I you know what? I I agree with that approach. I do think there's things that Najee Harris has to do, do better. I think that there were some of his vision, you know, his, some of his whole making to say, or decision making was not the best, but also that gets made. You, you often, sometimes when you're getting hit a lot, when you're having to deal with a lot of defenders getting the backfield, it messes you up when you do have openings and, and it makes yeah. it harder to make those reads. But I think one thing we saw was when Najee Harris had his chance to get to the second level and did, he made guys miss. He stiff on guys. He he was able to find ways to make make extra yards. And like with that Vikings game, when they when when the Steelers, it was funny. Just two years ago, we were talking about the Steelers couldn't convert third and fourth and ones. It just didn't happen. Ben Roethlisberger wasn't QB sneaking, and they didn't they didn't trust their running backs to go get it. That was not an issue in in 2021 i don't expect it to be an issue in 2022 and i think a part of that is Najee harris when you give him the opportunity the, the space to win mono e mono man man to man on the field he's going to win more of those than he loses and i think significantly more of those than he loses and so back to the jonathan taylor question if he can get not not the same amount of opportunities as Jonathan Taylor because again that offensive line they have a top 10 pick in Quentin Nelson who for my money is the best offensive lineman in the league right now they that's a group that's uh, that's on a different level that you know right now than the Steelers but if he can get more opportunities to get downfield not get hit in the backfield as as nearly as much and you're seeing you know maybe eight to ten times a game where his runs are he gets to you know four yards beyond the line of scrimmage and then he gets to make it make a move happen I think that puts him in the conversation of hey he he may be one of those one of those top running backs in the league. I think he already has put himself in the conversation of that, but to ascend to definitely, you know, put him in the, the Derrick Henry's, the Jonathan Taylors, the, the the that whole crew, he needs a little bit more help, not just from the offensive line too. He also needs his quarterbacks to scare defenses enough to say, "Hey, we got to honor the deep ball or we got to honor play action. We got to honor these tight ends over the middle so that the linebackers aren't flying up to go get Najee Harris because if he just gets that little more inch of space, that can get get him more daylight and the better opportunities to make big plays. And I think the over under of Najee Harris stiff arms we're going to see this season. I'm setting it at five and I'm taking the over. I'm setting it at five and taking the over. I mean, he throws a mean stiff arm, uh, and, and we did see we did see him on angry runs on NFL Network quite a few times. I expect him to have a similar type of year when it comes to when it comes to that. And I think that again, you give him more opportunities in space to use that stiff arm there's going to be some victims out there in the NFL. That's all we have time for today. Jenna, thank you so much for joining the Locked On Steelers podcast. It's always a great to have you here. Let people know where they, find, where they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. It is always great to be here, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. You can find me on Twitter at Jenna Harner 11, Instagram, Jenna underscore Harner, and on WPXI. We got a lot of awesome stuff. Um, I'm really excited because on Monday for the 4th of July, I get to uh, report live from the fireworks, which is like my dream. And I got to do it last year. So I get to do it again. It's really exciting. But stepping out of the sports realm for a night, doing some uh, fireworks coverage and then training camps right around the corner. Crazy. It is crazy. The year comes so so fast around. Thanks so much, Jenna, for joining us. Do follow her and all her great work and have fun with the fireworks. That's, that is that is pretty cool that you step it out and you get to do a little bit of a little bit of fun stuff that, that, that isn't sports. Um, but again, thank you, Jenna, for being on the show. Thank you, dear listeners and viewers, for checking us out. Always riding with us here. We appreciate all of our locked on Steelers listeners and viewers. Remember, you can find the show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you want to help out the show even further, go on Apple Podcasts right now. Leave us a five-star review with a positive comment. You do both at the same time and you get a special shout out at the end of the show like this person christian 60 garcia who says chris carter's the goat thank you christian and he says absolutely love this podcast chris does a great job of hosting the show and i love the different guests he has on every week keep up the great the good work and hashtag go Steelers. thank you christian for your five star review we've had a few this week so keep them coming please and you can get your shout out shout outs at the end of the show we appreciate everyone who gives them to us because it helps us boost the show we hope you have a great fourth of july weekend 
I, I am going to try to have a Monday show so that if you're sitting there and you're bored, at, you know, in the morning before all the cookouts start on 4th of July, I'm going to try to have a show up and ready for you. We're going to see what we can do with that. But if not, we will be back on Tuesday getting you ready with Tony Serino. He'll be back on the show next week as well. So happy 4th of July weekend to everybody and hope everyone has a great weekend. We'll be back on your screens and in your ears next week.